Mississippi flood of 1927 was the most destructive flood in the history of the United States. We chose this project because we wanted to learn more about this historic event. When we started our research, we thought that the port trading town of Bayou Sierra was destroyed by the flood of 1927. Bayou Sierra was a large trading port along the Mississippi River near the current town of St. Francisville. During our research, we learned that little was left of Bayou Sierra. Most of the settlers had moved uphill to the town of St. Francisville. One such flood, the flood of 1912, almost wiped out the trading port of Bayou Sierra. The few residents that remained were forced to leave the town after the flood of 1927 destroyed their homes once again. Today, nothing remains of the once critical trading port of Bayou Sierra. The flood of 1927 was a critical point in the history of the United States as well as in St. Francisville. Here is Professor Craig Colton from the Louisiana State University to tell us a little more about the flood of 1927. That year, there was a lot of snow that fell up in the north during the winter. And the real reason we have big floods here on the Mississippi behind me is when the snow melts almost all at the same time and you have at the same time heavy spring rain. So you have rain falling on snow which melts and then it slides down into all the rivers in the Ohio Valley and the upper, upper Illinois River and the Missouri River and the Arkansas River and that comes charging down the Mississippi. When that happens, when all those things happen at the same time, this river can rise and rise and rise. It's really high right now. And you can see behind me these trees in the river have their, their bases underwater. The river in 1927 rose to record heights. It had never risen that high. And one of the most interesting things about that flood that year was in 1926, the year before, the group that was responsible for building levees to keep flood waters out of the cities and the communities all up and down the river said, we have a levee system that is complete. It's ready to handle any flood the river throws at us. They miscalculated because they didn't realize how big the flood the very next year would be. So you had the Mississippi River rising and rising, and you saw floods rising in, in St. Louis, then down to, to New Madrid, then down to Memphis, and, and then down across Mississippi. And in Mississippi, the levees started popping left and right. On the, on the west bank in Arkansas and in the east bank in Mississippi, the levees were bursting and flooding the great cotton fields of the, of the Mississippi Delta uh, along the, uh, up in, in the Azo River Basin. People had to flee their homes, and there were hundreds and thousands of people living on top of the levees. It was the only safe ground. They had pictures of cattle and people crowding onto the levee in, in, in just despicable conditions. They had very little food, they had very little uh, coverage, they didn't have houses, they, they abandoned their houses. They didn't have extra clothes, they were just miserable. And it was springtime, it was a little bit cooler than right now, but they had to live huddled in those, those, on those levees for weeks and weeks and weeks. We learned from Professor Colton that when the federal government did provide resources, they weren't divided equally. When the floods were bursting upriver in Mississippi, people here in Louisiana knew that they were going to see the rivers flood. Day by day, the river got higher and higher. The flood crested the highest water came and passed Vicksburg and passed Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez sits on the big high bluff, so it didn't flood there. But on the west bank in Louisiana, near Faraday, the levees were popping and the river was flooding the agricultural land. The newspaper had accounts that the floods were coming. The big concern was New Orleans, the biggest city in the Mississippi Valley by far. The city was built on a floodplain behind levees. There was a great debate. What do we do to protect New Orleans and keep it safe? The people of New Orleans convinced the president to send the Army Corps of, Engineer, of Engineers, the people who built the levee, to take dynamite and blow a hole in the levee just downstream from New Orleans. The theory was if you blow a hole in the levee below New Orleans, the water will flow faster by New Orleans because it will suddenly have two mouths. The river will flow between the levees down its normal course. It will also veer off into St. Bernard Parish, creating a second temporary artificial mouth. And the water level will then fall in New Orleans. They did that and the water level did fall, but it may never have even flooded there. It did subside a bit and take the pressure off the levees.
it's really funny because rainfall, much of it fell up in the north a after there'd been a heavy snowpack that year. And I'm not sure of the rainfall totals, but the, the combined rain and snow was substantial. And they did have serious uh, river flooding in the Ohio River Basin. Down here that spring we had some flooding, some heavy rains in New Orleans, but that didn't affect the flooding here. Any rain that falls south of Bayou Serra, south of St. Francisville really, flows away from the Mississippi River. Rainfall here in, in south Louisiana doesn't even enter the Mississippi, unless it falls directly from the heavens into the river. Uh, so it, it, a little bit, but not enough to cause flooding. The flooding was due to rainfall and snowfall, and mainly in the Ohio and, and upper Mississippi River Basin, to a lesser extent in the Missouri River Basin. Probably the worst damage uh, were two areas. One was the area up around Greenville, Mississippi, what was called the Mississippi Delta, the area between, basically between Memphis and Vicksburg, the areas north, of, well north of, of uh, uh, Natchez, well north of St. Francisville. Uh, but that's an area that's low areas where the levees weren't sufficient to hold off the river. Uh, plus, there's the, the, the Yazoo River flows in by its own accord into the Mississippi there. It flooded. The Mississippi actually backed up into that basin and caused tremendous flooding. So you had some of the worst damage uh, in, the, in the Mississippi Delta. The second area of really substantial damage was in St. Bernard Parish, where they intentionally blew a hole in the river. Uh, and that just completely wiped out St. Bernard Parish and it wiped out the livelihood of the people that, who lived down there who trap, used to trap muskrats. But this flooded all the muskrats and killed all the muskrats. And St. Bernard Parish was the world's largest fur producing territory in the world, more so than in Siberia and Russia that has all this giant expanse of, of territory they have fur bearing animals. But St. Bernard Parish was the leading fur bearing producing place in the world before that flood. It did rebound a bit after that, but it never never was its, its former self in terms of, of, of um, fur production. Men, that doesn't, and when those, I say those are two of the two worst areas, that says nothing about the many, many other places, um, like near St. Francisville with Bayou Serra. Many small communities suffered tremendously, but they weren't larger areas like the St. Bernard Parish in the Mississippi Delta. How long did the flood last? Um, it depends on where you were in the river. Early April, it started coming down, and it, for at least a month, it was in transit from areas up north in Illinois and Ohio and Kentucky and those areas. And then you get, by the time it all had kind of disgorged into the, uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, a month and a half or so. Individual places like the Mississippi Delta probably saw water for two to three weeks at really, really high levels. So any given location saw the most intense flooding for a matter of weeks, but the whole thing took a few months actually to move from the north into the Gulf of Mexico. The flood caused millions and millions of dollars of damage. Um, and there are many different ways you can look at flood damage. It, it uh, flooded crops, so hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland produced no crops that year. Um, at least 400 people died. There's really no good accurate number of fatalities because some people simply weren't counted. Um, hundreds and hundreds of, of, well, thousands of homes were destroyed. Uh, so the damage was massive, uh, and, and it might pale in comparison to the dollar amount of damage we saw from Katrina, but the real damage to individuals and families and farmland was probably greater because of the area of the, of the, of the flooding. Uh, it was really an amazing story to, to, to look at the uh, pictures of the cattle and livestock that were moved up onto the levees from the farmland and in, in particularly in the Mississippi Delta. Thousands and thousands of head of cattle and horses and other livestock had to seek refuge and that really complicated the, the situation. We had a, a narrow levee 
and people and livestock both living on it created sanitation problems uh, and just basic crowding problems. So the animals were a real critical issue, more so with livestock, farm animals, than with pets. I forget the exact number of houses, but there were several thousands of homes, tens of thousands of homes that were, were inundated by this flooding. Much of the worst flooding was in either small towns in Mississippi or rural areas. So you didn't see a major urban area like New Orleans flooded. Even when they blew the levees in, in St. Bernard Parish, there you had thousands of homes instead of hundreds of thousands of homes like you would have in a big city. So the fact that it was mainly rural and small town uh, prevented more houses from being damaged. The, the best estimates are over 400 people died because of this flood. The, there's a lot of critics of that number because there wasn't much effort put into counting, particularly the poor uh, who, who died. People just didn't make, public health officials didn't, simply didn't make a good effort in counting. But when you think of 400, at least 400 people died, which is a, is a massive total for a river flood, that we saw coming for days and weeks. It was in the newspaper. A river flood on the Mississippi doesn't happen just because of a downpour and a flash flood that comes up overnight. We saw it coming. We knew it was coming gradually. And to lose 400 people because of that is, is just really uh, shows, reflects a poor response to this big flood. Well, one of the biggest one of the biggest things that, that came out of this is, is with that flood, with the massive loss of, of life, the massive damage, um, the Corps of Engineers basically rewrote their manual on how to build levees and what height to build them to. Plus, the really big change that really affects us here in Louisiana, particularly those of us in this area, um, is they built the Old River Control Structure and they built the Bonnie Carey Spillway between here and New Orleans. They abandoned an approach that we refer to as levees only. Before 1927, they wanted to fight floods with levees and only with levees. So we call it levees only. If you build levees tall enough and high enough and strong enough, you can keep all floods out. Well, that proved incorrect. The flood of 27 knocked down levees all up and down the river basin. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers said, wait a minute, we need to find another way to protect places particularly and more important than any other place in the valley, New Orleans, which was the big commercial port. Uh, so they said, we need to have outlets and levees. And an outlet is the Bonnie Carey spill where we can open gates and divert part of the water into Lake Pontchartrain, much like they did when they blew the hole in the levee artificially in St. Bernard Parish. They decided they'd build permanent fixed structures to serve as outlets so they didn't have to have the emergency of, of dynamiting and the uncontrolled circumstances of dynamiting the levee. So they created the Bonnie Carey Spillway and then the even bigger a Chafalaya Basin floodway. If you drive from here to Lafayette and you go up over the levee and you're up on the elevated highway for 20 miles, when there's a really major flood, the Corps of Engineers can divert water down the Chafalaya and prevent the river from getting too high south of Baton Rouge, getting too high in New Orleans. So they can create two outlets, the, the Chafla Basin Spillway and the Bonnie Carey, which is smaller. They've used the Bonnie Carey eight or nine times since they opened it in the 1930s, and they've used the, uh, the Chafalaya only once, back in 1973. In 1973, I used to go down and stand on the levees down near LSU, and the water was about a foot and a half from the top of the levee. It was that high for about a month. The levees were so saturated with the water you could bounce on them, it was like jello. It was just <laughs> amazing. And that's the only time they ever opened up the Atchafalaya Basin Spillway because it was such uh, a threat to the levees. And, and by building these spillways, they did affect a change that will really, really will provide better protection than just levees. So the flood of 27 prompted them to do that. In May of 2011, the waters began to rise once again along the Mississippi floodplain. Although water levels reached heights that were comparable to the flood of 1927, the damage was considerably less severe. The levee and spillway system proved successful.
On May 14, 2011, the Army Corps of Engineers began to partially open the Morganza Spillway for the second time in its history. The water was diverted from the Mississippi River to the Atchafalayan Basin, thereby flooding the plain. This, however, allowed them to protect levees and prevent major flooding in the metropolitan areas of Baton Rouge and New Orleans.